from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Going green without having to spend a lot of green. In places that have a uh, lack of water, you know, that they can have a green space without having to maintain the water. The latest in turf technology with a little help from soybeans. Is it time to plant where you farm? If we're going out there and pushing it, we're going to put in a compaction. And what you need to know before you put wheels down, as more cases of avian flu are reported in dairy cattle. We want to make, assure uh, our consumers that our product is safe. The latest as producers work to contain the spread right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when blood, sweat, and tears meet rain, wind, and sun. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. More cases of avian flu are being reported in dairy cattle. USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service confirming more cases at the end of last week. Now here's a look at the updated map from APHIS. It's now reporting 26 cases in eight states. Last week, it added South Dakota and North Carolina to the list, along with reporting additional cases in New Mexico and Texas. Texas hit the hardest, now reporting 11 cases in dairy cattle and New Mexico with a total of six cases. South Dakota officials, the latest to encourage producers to closely monitor their herds and contact their veterinarian immediately if cattle appear to have symptoms. 17 states have put in place restrictions on the importation of dairy cattle. Agnes Michelle Rook spoke with Marv Post, the chairman of the South Dakota Dairy Producers Association, about whether South Dakota will now do the same. That is not our goal. We, we would prefer, if at all possible, that we can continue to maybe test, uh, quarantine, test, and then ship, or some alternative, because if we're not moving those calves uh, to their facility to be raised, we're creating another whole big bottleneck, uh, and so uh, we almost have to keep cattle moving, if, if at all possible. USDA is continuing to tell consumers the pasteurization of milk kills that virus and so milk and dairy products are safe to consume. Later today, USDA will release a new crop progress report detailing whether planting is running ahead of schedule or slightly behind. But in some areas of the Midwest, farmers may be waiting for a while longer. Farm Journal getting an update from agronomist Ken Ferry on what he's seeing. Ferry says right now in central Illinois, it's too wet for corn planting but the current forecast calls for warmer temperatures and that could have farmers starting to roll. Right now, he says he's more worried about higher soil moisture levels. If we're going out there and pushing it, we're gonna put in a compaction layer and that compaction layer just keeps on giving all season long. So the service calls that I go on in June and July, 80 to 90% of the compaction issues I have to deal with with our customers come from the first pass that they're getting pretty nervous right now to make. The first pass is where most trouble comes from. Ferry says when it comes to soybeans, it's a different story. We've learned that if we can get these beans planted early enough, we can get some pre solstice flowering. Last year we had flowering on some of our early beans by May 27th. When you consider the solstice at the 21st of June, that's, that's pretty good. And that usually brings along a premium in yield. We need about 950 growing degree days before the solstice, and when we're talking about group four beans, we need about 810 uh, on our group threes. And a word of caution, Ferry says with the warm winter weather farmers had in central Illinois, greater numbers of corn flea beetles survived, which increases the possibility Stewart's wilt bacterium will also persist through winter. Heavy rains led to flash flooding in several states, including Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and South Carolina. More than three inches of rain fell in downtown Charleston on Thursday. The storms were part of a large weather system that also hit parts of the Gulf Coast in Florida. That system moving through parts of New England on Friday before leaving the U.S. over the weekend. So will those warmer temperatures many saw over the weekend be sticking around this week? Meteorologist Martin Lorimore lets us know what that means for farmers hoping to get some planning done. 
Yeah, that's right. We are still seeing several of those uh, showers and actually a handful of those warmer temperatures moving through. It's also going to bring in a handful of storms as well on our Monday and Tuesday. Watching as a cold front moves through, we could see some strong to severe storms in this area of Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas for that afternoon time frame for your Monday specifically. Look at the possibility of some strong to severe storms out there, including possibility of hail, damaging winds, and yes, the possibility of tornadoes is there. Then the threat of those storms starts moving a little bit northward along this low pressure for our Tuesday. Could see some of those storms near Chicago getting a little bit strong as well. Luckily, as it does move to the north, that threat does fall down a little bit. And also looking at some more snow chances out toward parts of the Rockies. Northern Rockies could pick up several more inches of snowfall as we approach May. Yeah, we're already getting pretty close into that springtime, so keep a watch out as you go throughout the rest of this week, especially with this big storm moving its way through. And here's a picture, perfect planting picture from Matt Myers. Matt saying it doesn't get much better than this, and you know what? We agree. Hope planting goes well for Matt here in Geneva, Nebraska, and all of you farmers starting up that planting. Well, I'm warning forecast coming up. USDA is cutting another 1% off its previous all U.S. orange production forecast. It's now forecasting all orange production to be 2.73 million tons. That's still up 7% from last year. Now, most of the change coming with Florida's orange crop now forecast to be 18.8 .8 million boxes, down 5% from the previous forecast, but again, up 19% from last season. California, they're non Valencias and Valencias, their oranges are unchanged. Texas, for March, they went from 950,000 all oranges to 1.1 million of oranges. Worth noting, overall citrus production in Florida, it has dropped by a whopping 93% over the past two decades. President Biden holding a trilateral meeting with leaders of the Philippines and Japan last week. The leaders announcing a new economic corridor in the Philippines. It's part of the G7 Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment. Officials say it would help develop clean energy, agriculture, and other projects in the country. This is the first corridor in the Indo-Pacific. It means more jobs for people across the entire region. It means more investment in sectors critical to our future. Clean energy, ports, railroads, agriculture, and much more. I'm looking forward to discussing all this with all of you. President Biden has made improving relations with the Philippines a priority since Ferdinand Marcos Jr. became the country's president in June of 2022. Grains and livestock trend in opposite directions to end last week. We'll talk markets coming up next. And later, from fields of soybeans to fields for athletes, we'll see how one company is taking soybeans and turning it into turf in the country. Grain finished strong, but cattle and hog markets sputtered to close out the week. Michelle Rook takes a closer look in markets now. Well, a lower day in the livestock futures on Friday, but a rally in the grains. Chip Nellinger, Blue Reef Agri Marketing is back with us. And Chip, we had a lot of money flow issues last Friday, and it looked like profit taking by the funds in a lot of sectors. Yeah, and it was a really interesting day Friday. Um, uh, you know, outside markets are really extremely volatile. Uh, you know, kind of harkens back to the, uh, the the late 70s when we saw this last inflationary push in metals markets. Just going haywire on Friday. The dollar index was sharply higher uh, all week long uh, last week. Um, and then, as you mentioned, the, the interesting thing on Friday to me was it just seemed like, at least across the agricultural sector, both the grains and the livestock, uh, it was the fun mentality of just get me out. I don't care if it's a losing position or a profitable position. I just want out of it. And so the funds had had big, long positions built up across the livestock sector. Uh, looks like uh, late week they're exiting that in mass and also there are big shorts in the grains and we saw some unexpected buying. I mean, there wasn't anything on Friday that would have led you to believe that beans would be 20 cents higher at one point no. uh, during the day. And, and yet here we are, uh, you know, with the funds running for the exit. So it's a little bit nerve wracking, um, wondering, you know, scratching my head saying, is there something else big going on out here? Is there a big fund or a big bank in trouble? Um, you know, what's going to bring um you know that to light remains to be seen but it's a little bit nerve-wracking here so do we see as we start a new week this trend continue is it a start of a trend 
Well, you know, I think that remains to be seen. There's still some fundamental stuff going on. Uh, you know, I think the USDA report last week uh, with the big discrepancies between what the actual size of the South American crops are going to be is still something that needs to be uh, rectified, and that's going to take some time. Uh, the weather market uh, still matters here as far as whether we're going to be able to get planting kicked off uh, in an early uh, at an early pace. And so there's some fundamental things that still matter. But uh, boy, uh, you know, this money flow situation, you have to wonder if we're not just getting that ball started. Uh, it could be quick, but uh, it, there's uh, I, I just guess that there's interesting uh, couple of weeks dead ahead of us uh, with a lot of volatility uh, right uh, right in front of us. Thanks so much for joining us, Chip Nelliger, Blue Reef Agri Marketing. We'll have more Ag Day coming up. Farming has changed. Markets are riskier than ever. For customized, focused commodity marketing, contact Chip Nellinger or Adam Dreyer at 309-550-7213. We were talking about it earlier this show. We were talking about those strong, severe storms out toward parts of the southern plains, and we're going to get more in depth into it as we get into this next couple of seconds. So Monday, we're watching for the possibility of strong to severe thunderstorms. Area here in yellow, seeing that possibility of seeing some of those severe storms. Meanwhile, the area in orange is kind of that bullseye zone. Now, this place is not necessarily too unfamiliar with severe weather. It is central Oklahoma, capital of Tornado Alley, so to speak. But again, several of these storms do have the possibility of having large hail, strong winds and damaging tornadoes are expected for this. Again, I know that a lot of places here not necessarily, you know, new to this, but just keep a watch out as you go throughout that Monday afternoon. The storms could get a little bit aggressive as we head into the afternoon time frame. So just keep an extra close eye out. If you are going to be out in the afternoon, keep yourself close by to a safe area. Winds are also going to get pretty gusty as well with these storms, and this is not something we're going to be able to escape for a lot of us. Winds could be reaching up to 35, 40 miles an hour with these uh, this cold front moving by, and it's also going to go all the way across the nation. Look at that swath of the purple going all the way from the UP of Michigan all the way down to nearly southern Arkansas, seeing the possibility of strong winds. Could be seeing a large swath of the nation sitting under a wind advisor as we get into our Tuesday and Wednesday. That'll continue into the eastern seaboard as we head into that next part of our work week and the precipitation as well looking to be a little bit aggressive for a lot of us. A lot of this area in yellow. That's an inch in a couple places out toward parts of Iowa, Minnesota and even Wisconsin up to two inches of that rainfall. Plenty of it's going to be coming down. Places in Iowa do definitely need it. As we're looking at the drought monitor, you can see some possibilities of a little bit of an extreme drought. This is the brand new drought monitor that came out on our Thursday. Now, you can look at some places out toward New Mexico, right into southeastern portion of New Mexico. There is still sitting in an exceptional drought, and sadly, not really expecting to see any of that rainfall anytime soon really would be a good thing to get a little bit of that rainfall. But as we hit in the jet stream, there's that low pressure bringing in the possibility of those storms across our Monday and then eventually your Tuesday across again, mainly Illinois, where that crossover between the energy and the moisture that's right now looking to be the best place to see those storms on our Tuesday. This will continue on as we get into our Wednesday and Thursday, and this will combine with another low could bring in a little bit chillier weather yet again across parts of Minnesota and even into parts of the Great Lakes. So it's something you'll definitely have to be watching out for as you get into the last part of that work week and the next, next weekend. But as you notice, in the southern portion of the nation, these lines right here, very straight. That's nice, calm weather for anybody going to be south around I-40. Tuttle, Oklahoma, warm. It's going to be nice. High, high of 81. Be a little bit windy, though. Some Summersville, West Virginia, a little cooler. High around 60 degrees and partly cloudy. And finally, Geneva, Nebraska. Feeling pretty warm out there. High, mid 80s, partly cloudy. A nice day. Tractor sales are down to start the year. We'll have the latest numbers and machinery Pete coming up next. And later, from farmers to football fields, we'll look at the work being done to turn soybeans into turf in the country. March was not a great month for tractor sales. The Association of Equipment Manufacturers reporting they were down 12% from the same month last year. In March, just under 19,000 tractors were sold, which compares to more than 21,000 sold last year. Now, the biggest drop for the month and the year so far continues to be the smaller two-wheel drive units under 40 horsepower. 
Meanwhile, combine sales for the year are off 20%. Tractors continue to dominate the used equipment market, and as Machinery Pete tells us, the prices continue to break records. Well, I tell you what, folks, my good friends at the Steffes Crew, they have been busy. They had 547 auctions last year in 2023, and I think they've picked up the pace here at 24. Now, here's just a few examples of tractors they sold last week at auction that caught my eye. So last Tuesday on an auction in Kensal, North Dakota, this 2006 Case H MX305, 3,903 hours on it. They sold it for 110,000 bucks. Third highest auction price ever on an MX305 with over 3,500 hours. Next day, last Wednesday, on a farm retirement auction in Laird, North Dakota, they sold this 2012 John Deere 9510 on our tractor, 1,962 hours, 292,500 dollars, highest auction price ever on a 9510R with over $1,600. Next day, last Thursday, on an online farm auction in Rosone, Minnesota, this cool looking 1972 International 1468 open station, 6,616 hours on it, sold for 44,000 bucks, seventh highest auction price ever on a 1468. Same day last week, Thursday, different auction in Herman, Minnesota. They sold this 2011 Case Magnum 315 with 2,141 hours on it. 121,000 bucks, third highest auction price ever on an 11 model Magnum 315 with over 2,000 hours on it. Same day last Thursday, different auction, Audubon, Minnesota. This 2004 John Deere 9420, 6,683 hours on it. They sold it for 72,500 bucks, eighth highest auction price ever on a 9240 with over 6,000 hours. We'll wrap up again another auction last Thursday. Online custom harvester auction at Colby, Kansas. They sold three 23 model John Deere 8R 340s hours, basically from 700 to 800 hours. They went for two of one for 311,000, one for 308,000. Folks, right on the money there. I've seen 14 John Deere 8R 340s sold at auction so far this year. Average auction price, $310,107. All right, thanks, Pete. Well, AstroTurf is popping up on fields everywhere. Up next, we'll see a type of turf made from soybeans from field to field in the country. Buyers are looking for greener, more sustainable options in the products they buy and farmers are delivering. This includes helping with the development of products like soy-based artificial turf. Agnes Michelle Rook recently toured a facility where the one-of-a-kind innovation is being manufactured. Sports Group, located here in Dalton, Georgia, has developed soy-based artificial turf that covers anything from landscaping to sports facilities. Its subsidiaries like Sinlon and AstroTurf are the only companies using soybeans in their artificial turf. So we put the soy in the backings of our product so it displaces the petroleums that are normally used um, in products like these. Because Sinlon uses soybean oil, it's a greener, safer and more sustainable alternative to conventional artificial turf. On the environmental side, we don't, we don't intentionally produce with PFAs. We have leaching tests, toxicity tests, heat tests, uh, fire safety tests. In places that have a uh, lack of water, you know, that they can have a green space without having to maintain the water. So it has many applications, including landscaping, recreation, and hospitality. We have park and recreation. We have your schools, school playgrounds. We have hospitality, we have automotive, we work with flag hotels. We do a lot of work with multifamily organizations uh, and developers, and then also golf. AstroTurf is another division of sports group. Its focus is sports facilities. We use it on for all of our sports athletic fields. So we have baseball, softball, lacrosse, soccer, football. AstroTurf already adorns various high school, college, and pro sports facilities, including in South Dakota. South Dakota State University, Dakota State University both have football fields, and Dakota State has a soccer field that has the soy back turf. And these products are gaining the attention of companies looking to lower their carbon intensity score at a reasonable price. Kind of extends that sustainability story. It can contribute to lead credits, lead points, uh, which is a value to that particular property. The minimal, uh, you know, changes in price without compromising quality. 
This and various other new uses are a result of research funded by soybean farmers. It's a representation of what farmers can do with innovation. And these new uses add value to soybean oil and ultimately soybeans. Anything we can do to create demand is, we hope, improves the bottom line. I'm Michelle Brook reporting for Ag Day. All right, great story. Thanks, Michelle. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Gross. Have a great day.